Good evening, everyone. I now call this meeting of the Standing Committee on Government Operations back to order. We are now in the public portion of tonight's meeting, and the meeting is being live streamed on the Assembly's social media channels. I'd like to begin by asking the members present to introduce themselves, starting on my left. <clears throat> Ron Bonjouz, Decho. Lisa Semler, Inuvik Twin Lakes. Alan Johnson, I'm the MLA for Yellowknife North. Uh, Kevin O'Reilly, Fran Lake. Our two staff members. April Taylor, committee advisor. Glenn Rutland, committee clerk. And my name is Freda Marzellos, and I'm from Thabatcha. The Standing Committee on Government Operations reviews the annual reports of the Legislative Assembly statutory officers. This includes the Official Languages Commissioner, the Human Rights Commission, and the Information and Privacy Commissioner. Tonight, the committee will be reviewing the first annual report of the Ombud of the Northwest Territories, Colette Le Lengua. Legislation creating the Ombud was passed in the 18th Assembly after repeated calls for such an office. The office was established in 2019 and has been completed its first year of activities. As committee and the public will hear, it is the Ombud's role to ensure decisions and actions taken by the Government of the Northwest Territories are done so fairly. Good evening, Ms. Langua. Uh, before you begin your opening remarks, I would like to review how the meeting will proceed. All comments, questions, and remarks will need to be directed to myself as the chair. Both members and witnesses will need to wait to be recognized by the chair before speaking. This process is required to allow the committee clerk to turn on and off people's microphones. Ms. Langua, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and, and thank you, uh, thank you, members. So I am pleased to present the 2019, 2020, and first ever annual report of the Office of the Ombud of the Northwest Territories. En français, je suis la protectrice du citoyen. So in French, my title translates as protector of citizens. And uh, interestingly, the translation that came back from both Cree and South Slavia is, is very similar in meaning. Uh, in North Slavey, the translation is that we are the people who help people who complain. And in Chippewaian, the translation is we help people that don't get help. Um, so it was a very interesting exercise for us to send out the, um, to, to ask translators, you know, and these are, this is all new terminology, to come up with, with some way of expressing this in their language. And it was interesting to see that, that reflected back. And I hope when eventually I'm able to travel to communities and, and we're working with interpreters that, that we'll get some more discussion on that because I, I think it's personally just very interesting and, and fascinating how that worked out. Uh, so it has now been just over one year since the office opened. This is a significant milestone that, that we celebrate with the many people, um, including a number of current and former members who advocated for and worked toward the creation of a Northwest Territories Ombud Office for more than 25 years. I have always been mindful of how much effort went into making this office a reality before I came on the scene. And I, I sometimes feel like on April 8th last year in 2019, I was handed somebody's tiny baby to look after. Uh, and I've tried to treat the office with the same, uh, same care that would be appropriate in that situation. And I guess given that the mandate is five years, maybe it's my job to bring the, the baby to readiness for kindergarten. That, that seems like about the right time frame. This first year has demonstrated, if anyone had any doubts, how much the NWT needed an independent office to speak up for fairness and look into people's concerns about their dealings with government. If you are someone who applied for a program or service and someone told you no and you don't understand why or you think it's unfair, you can call us. If you or a loved one are in a government facility, that could be a hospital, a correctional center, uh, residential care, or even the mandatory isolation centers, and you're concerned about the conditions there, you can call us. If you are a business owner and you believe you were treated unfairly in a procurement or tendering process or on a loan application, you can call us. If you are a parent and you are concerned about something going on at your child's school, if you are not sure if the government applied a policy to your situation in the right way, or if you have tried to solve a problem with government and it feels like no one is listening, you can call us. 
There is no risk to talking to us about your concern. We'll listen carefully. We won't share your information unless you decide you want us to do that to deal with your complaint. If we are not the right place for you, we will do our best to point you in the direction of someone who is, and we can also help you plan what you want or need to, to say to them. We opened 48 potential complaint files in the period between November 18th, 2019 and March 31st, 2020, which is when the reporting period ended. Some were about a single transaction, like a healthcare card application. Others were more complicated disputes that had gone on for quite a long time where everything that could go wrong did and sometimes more than one authority was involved. Many of them involved uh, communications issues and that could be anything from a policy with difficult wording that, that people had trouble understanding to uh, government just not responding to an information request at all. Uh, there are a couple of examples in this report and, and you can expect to see more examples of our work in, in future reports. It may be that the comments we received say more than the numbers and I, I will share a few of those with you now. Thank you for listening. I have hope now. You took my issues seriously and shone a light on my situation. And at least I know what happened to me won't happen to anyone else. This last example illustrates how ombud services can be very different from other kinds of justice. It is true that sometimes it is too late for us to help a complainant to fix their own situation. Maybe the deadline's already passed, they've missed an opportunity, or the damage has been done. However, that does not mean that there is no point in contacting our office. Even if it is too late for you, your complaint can help prevent other people from going through the same thing, and we encourage you to talk to us about it. Making a complaint doesn't mean a person is a nuisance or a troublemaker. It is an act of good citizenship that can help your fellow residents and, and northerners. Ombud procedures are not the same as those of courts and tribunals. Our services are free and people don't need a lawyer to use us. Our process is also more flexible and informal. An ombuds office is more than a dispute resolution service, although that is certainly part of what we do. The larger purpose of all our work is to improve public service. In this, we find common ground with the staff and departments and agencies. Our overall approach is non-adversarial, which leaves room for us to have frank discussions and, and do problem solving with public servants. I met with deputy ministers the first day I took office and have had other meetings with them and with senior management teams since then. They know I'm available anytime they have questions or want to talk things over, and they know I want to work with them. So my intent is not to shame or embarrass government, it's to fix the things that are wrong and prevent the same problems from happening again. I think it's important to remember that the idea of administrative fairness is new to most of the NWT public, and that includes government as, as well, and, and that influences the, the approach I'm taking in this, this first mandate for the office. Some feedback I've received from senior public servants is that they appreciate our help making their processes fairer, that they see our interventions as opportunities to get to the bottom of complicated disputes and to get closure on difficult files some of which have been around for a long time, and to improve day-to-day -day services. So I'm not, I'm not naive. I know my office will eventually get into conflicts with authorities. There's going to be points where we disagree, but that, that hasn't happened yet. And I believe that a cooperative approach is more effective and appropriate, especially now when this is so new to everyone and there's a clear willingness to work together. I do sometimes have to have to use a sterner tone, um, you know, when when my uh, my emails or my phone calls don't get answered for a certain period of time, you know, I definitely call people and and I'm quite assertive about that. But I I don't think I need to be Darth Ombud to uh, to get the job done. I will now say something about the recommendations for changes to the Ombud Act. That's quite a long section in the report, and you'll probably be relieved to hear I won't go through them in detail, um, but I do want to, to speak to a few highlights. So the first um, set of recommendations is about jurisdiction, and that, that's what complaints the office can and cannot consider. The way the Ombud Act is structured, it lists each authority that the Act applies to specifically. So if an authority is not on the list, the Act does not apply. This has come up with some complaints about things like staffing appeals and, and the rental office, and people were very disappointed we couldn't look into those concerns. 
The approach other jurisdictions use in their legislation includes um, appointed officials, and it would capture a number of boards and, and appeals bodies like the rental officer, uh, the social assistance appeals board, employment standards board, uh, the staffing appeals that operate outside of departments. And those, those are positions that are usually filled by contractors and appointees, so they're not carried out by government employees, and that's why, that's why the Act doesn't apply to them. Uh, the Act also restricts me from looking at matters from before January 1st, 2016, and in most cases that practically that would, that would make sense. Um, by, by the time that much time has gone by, a lot of documents might not be easy to trace. Um, the people that were involved might have moved on. Uh, but it has created some problems with a few complaints where some of the events of concern happened before that date and some of them happened afterward and it was really frustrating for, for those people to hear that we could only look at part of their complaint because of this provision because in those cases the documents and the people were, were there um, that, that we could have looked into what happened. So we're partially investigating their complaint but not everything that happened. The second set of recommendations in the report deals with a number of issues that, that are more procedural, and some of them are quite technical. If there's interest, I can certainly answer questions about them later, but I, I won't go through them. Um, what I will say generally is that there are some provisions that don't work together so well just because they were borrowed from, from different jurisdictions. So what can happen is if you take Section 15 from Province A, it might not work so well if you combine it with Section 33 from, from Province B. And that's not something that would have been obvious to the drafters. It, it shows up more when, when I was working trying to set up the procedures and figure out how, how to operationalize some of the, um, the parts of the Act. Another thing that can happen if you take Section 5 from one province, you might also need Section 22 from the same province because they work together. And again, that's not necessarily something that's, that's obvious when, when people are drafting the legislation. It, it shows up later. So a good example of that case is Recommendation 10, and that, that has to do with, uh, that's a provision that uh, makes it clear that authorities can, can voluntarily give information to the Ombud. And the reason that's important is because, like Saskatchewan, we can do informal resolutions or early resolutions outside of the investigation process. So that means when we're asking um, government departments for information to do that informal resolution, we are asking for it. We're not requiring it like we would in an investigation process. So it would be helpful to have a provision that tells public authorities they can give us information voluntarily. Uh, we do have some workarounds to make sure we don't get anyone in trouble. Um, they do sometimes ask me, you know, what what authority I have to ask for information or, or what we've done to make sure they're okay. And I, I generally write a letter to, to make it very clear to them. Um, but I'm usually pointing to provisions possibly in the Access to Information and Protection of Privacy Act. I think once I might have had to cite some case law. Um, so it's not it, it, it's not as straightforward as it is would be helpful for it to be. Um, we heard from our colleagues in Saskatchewan that having that provision there makes some people a lot less nervous when talking to the Ombudsman Office because some staff, the, especially the first time they talk to us, it's, it, they're, they're really, um, really nervous about, about even talking to us. And I just think it's a kind thing to do for public servants that are trying to work with us to have a provision like that that we can show them and say, you see, it's okay to, to give us the information that we're asking for. And again, it's not a problem when we're doing investigations. It's really um, the informal resolutions, and it just has to do with the, the way the whole act is, is structured around that. Um, I'll also highlight Recommendation 12, which has to do with the independence of the office. And this is a provision in the act that the administrative policies of the clerk can override the ombuds policies and procedures for complaints and investigations. And I, I do find that troubling. Um, there's no provision like this in any of the other statutory officers' legislation in the NWT uh, or, or in any other Canadian legislation that I know of. I looked at all the, the Ombuds Acts. I didn't look at all the other um, statutory officer legislation. And I, I, I certainly don't mean to suggest that there's been any actual attempt to interfere with our policies and procedures, but perception is important, and it's also important to, um, to avoid perception of or potential inter for interference by the office of the clerk. So again, it's not that something's actually happened that concerns me, it's just it's more the potential for it and the message that that, that provision sends. Um, statutory officers report to the Legislative Assembly, that's, that's how the acts are structured. We don't report to the office of the clerk and for us to have credibility with the public and with deputy ministers and CEOs, we have to be and be seen to be independent um, and executive officers. And we need to avoid any appearance that we're simply staff of the office of the clerk because then the perception is that we're being um, 
somehow influenced um, influenced by that relationship. Uh, there's a bigger discussion, I think, to be had about the role of the Office of the Clerk with respect to statutory offices. It's quite appropriate for them to have a coordinating role. I'm not saying we should never work together or talk about things, but a coordinating role is different from an oversight role, and I, I think that's an important distinction. The final two recommendations uh, for legislative changes in the report deal with terminology, and I think they're, they're self-explanatory, so I won't go into further detail on them. I will, though, take a sip of water. It is 2020, uh, for a few more weeks at least, and I can't uh, make my remarks without saying something about the impact of the coronavirus pandemic. This has been a topic of conversation for several months uh, in our uh, Canadian Ombuds forums, as well as the International Ombuds Institute. I've participated in a number of video calls. We're comparing notes, both about the kinds of complaints we're getting and, and how we're um, able to keep our, our offices running during this time. I am pleased to report that we were able to keep our complaints processes going with only minor changes and without any interruption. And departments and agencies continue to respond to our inquiries and usually with minimal delays, even though they, they were also working remotely and had to do some, uh, some workarounds. The pandemic has unfortunately had an impact on our public information and education plans for this year. Travel was and still is not possible, and many events that we would have participated in, like trade shows, were, were cancelled anyway. And this was really disappointing for me, both, both professionally and personally. Um, I, I, I'm someone I, I appreciate the, the people and the landscapes of all the, the territories, regions. I've, I've travelled, I've been to almost every community. Uh, I lived in Norman Wells for a time, I, I lived in Anuvik for a very short time, and I really, really do like to meet people. Um, I, I was in the process of making plans to travel to, to Inuvik and the Delta region just before the pandemic was declared. So of course that was canceled. And you know, I was thinking even uh, in September, I was driving to Samba Day Park to go camping for the weekend. Of course, I was listening to the radio ombudsman podcasts on my, uh, on my stereo. And I was just wishing I could have kept going to Fort Simpson and, and the other Decho communities, you know, with my tent and just, you know, gone ombudding all over the, the Decho. So, you know, maybe, maybe next year we'll be able to do that. It would be, it would be nice. I know the staff are anxious to, to get out and, and interact with people as well. So we're, we're really looking forward to that. I, I did read all of the standing committee reports about the Ombud Act uh, when I started this role, going back a couple of assemblies. And I know that one thing that people said was they wanted the Ombud to visit their communities in person and not stay in their office all the time. And I'm, I'm really mindful of that. And it is, it is important to me that, that I do that. We were able to lay a good foundation for, for public education and information in 2019-2020. We got the website launched, um, so it's a full mirror site in French, and we've got information in all the Indigenous official languages on the site as well. We ran print ads and public service announcements. Uh, we also developed pamphlets and business cards, which we sent out to community governments and, and organizations over the summer. You might have seen our social media ads or heard about us on CKLB's Sunday Bannock and Tea Show. Early in the year, I did get to public meetings in Fort Smith, and thank you, Madam Chair, for your, your invitation to your constituency meeting. I'm, I'm glad we were able to do that before the pandemic. Uh, and we also had a meeting in, in Hay River. Uh, I also met with um, several uh, staff of um, NGOs, and they in turn were, were very helpful in getting the word out to their members and clients. And we did also get an introductory online training for public servants into the GNWT's training calendar. It's called Fairness 101, and it's, uh, it's a nice interactive um, one-hour training that was developed by the BC Ombudsman, Ombudsperson's Office that they were kind enough to let us borrow. So all of these efforts have certainly helped raise awareness of the office, and more and more I'm hearing that people have heard about us from somebody else who, who contacted us, so that's, that's a good sign. Um, however, I know that for many people, it's just not comfortable to pick up a phone and call someone or send an email when they don't know who they are going to be talking to. That's why as soon as it's safe to do so from a public health perspective, I will make it a priority to spend time traveling and meeting people throughout the NWT. And I very much look forward to this. So the office has come a long way from its beginnings in a basement bedroom just over a year and a half ago. Uh, this strange word, ombud, is starting to become more familiar to NWT residents. We have joined strong national and international networks of ombuds. We have built relationships with public authorities and community organizations. 
that help us hear about and resolve complaints more quickly, and we have closed close to 150 files. We've helped people navigate through government, and we've solved problems, and we have shown authorities ways to prevent future complaints. Most importantly, we've listened. So thank you, Madam Chair. That concludes my, my opening comments, and I look forward to comments and questions from committee members. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. We will now open the floor for questions. Are there any questions? Emily O'Reilly. Uh, thanks, uh, Madam Chair. If you'd asked me four years ago, I, I wasn't sure that we would actually be here hearing your first uh, report. So it's, this is a really emotional time for me. So thanks very much. Um, I did want to ask a couple of questions. Um, you, I saw in your report that 83 GNWT employees have uh, taken the, the training, uh, online training that you just referred to. And I'm just wondering um, if you're getting any feedback on that. And I could see that there was a big concentration of people in infrastructure that took it, which is great because they're, they're the ones that are probably doing some of the, the procurement stuff. But um, I'm just wondering if you have any, if you're getting any feedback and if you have any thoughts about um, whether we should be trying to make this I don't want to use the word mandatory, but something like highly recommended for GNWT employees. So any thoughts along those lines would, would be helpful for me to, to know. Thanks, Madam Chair. Ms. Langlois, do you want to answer that? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I, I can't recall exactly when we when we introduced that training program. I think it might have been in February. So the reporting probably only reflects about six weeks or so that the, the program was available. I know that as of um, I think the last time I checked into it was May, and I know that they were still getting a lot of uh, a lot of uptake. I remind um, departments and agencies about that training every time I talk to them. I just did a, a presentation for Aurora College this morning, and you know, I expect we'll we'll get some uptake from them. Um, I have I haven't had feedback about the quality of the training or whether it's useful, but I I've done it myself and my staff have done it, and I I think it's quite good quality, and it's also short. It's a it's a one hour introduction and it's interactive and it's it's um, easy to go through. Uh, I've thought that I might suggest at some point to the government that they look at including it as part of their employee onboarding program. They have a number of short um, webinars and things that people have to take when they first start. So that's uh, that's definitely a thought I had. And we're also working, although I haven't been able to launch it yet, on, uh, on some more um, comprehensive training for staff, so either a half-day or a one-day training program. And that would probably be aimed more at managers uh, and at people who, who develop policies and procedures so they can be thinking about that as they're, they're doing that, and then maybe a half-day workshop for frontline staff. So there's definitely more training in the works, and that was really just a stopgap to get something out there really quickly. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, supplementary, uh, Emily O'Reilly. Thanks, Madam Chair. Yeah, one other question I had was, um, you do, of course, have the ability to initiate investigations of your own accord. And I'm just wondering uh, whether you did any in your first year. And I don't want you to tip your hat, but if there's any areas that you think you may want to look at in the future, that that seems to be systemic or whatever, I, just be... Um, interesting to know that, uh, if you thought about that and if there's areas. Thanks, Madam Chair. Islam Gua. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. So I look at the the potential for this to be a systemic issue with with every complaint we get, and that doesn't necessarily require me to to do an own motion investigation. If there's a way to solve the problem for everybody and not just for that one complainant, then I work with authorities to do that. And a lot of them have taken me up on, on informal suggestions as opposed to writing a full report and recommendations. So that's that's happening informally. Um, I haven't used the own motion power yet. I did have a complaint come up that I thought that would be useful for. However, just because of the pandemic situation, I knew the response would be, we can't do this because of the pandemic. So I, I will park that, but I would say in a year or two, I'll probably um, go back to that. It, it has to do with timing delays, so they're going to tell me it's because of the pandemic. That's why they're behind. 
Um, yeah, it's certainly something I always keep in mind. If I ever get a complaint, for example, about a, a facility, it hasn't happened yet, but um, any any complaint where I would not have to identify the complainant, where they might be worried about um, some kind of reprisal. So, for example, if somebody was in a residential care facility or their loved one was and they were worried about conditions there, that's the kind of thing I would look at as an own motion complaint so I don't have to identify the, the complainant. I can just go do the investigation. But I'm always, always looking out for systemic issues. I just haven't had to go there yet. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh... MLA Cleveland. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, then thank you very much to Madame Lingua for your time this evening and congratulations on your first annual report. That's very exciting and, and very wonderful to see. Um, my first question this evening is in regards to the Languages Commissioner. Um, we're about to have a hopefully a new Languages Commissioner come on board uh, for uh, the Northwest Territories here. and. Within the role of the Ombud and the role of the Languages Commissioner, there is some overlap in the type of investigative powers that both roles have. So I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit to how you see your relationship um, with this new person coming on board and being able to potentially work together and, um, and, and how you see your offices working together. Thank you. Ms. Languel. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So when it comes to individual complaints, um, none of the statutory offices work together, and that's because we all have confidentiality um, arrangements. So for example, even if I know something is probably a human rights issue and I've sent somebody to Human Rights Commission, I don't pick up the phone and call them and say, hey, what did you do with this complaint? Like, we, we really have to keep that separate. But in terms of, of administration, I when I certainly started, I certainly talked to both the Languages and Commissioner and the Information and Privacy Commissioner and the Human Rights Commission just to get information about how they worked and share some common interest, you know, how their computer systems worked, how their phones worked. Um, one of the things I'm, I'm working on, I've actually contacted all the statutory officers now because we've never had a meeting with all of us together and we're trying to set something up online for, for January because I think there are some opportunities for, for all of us to be working together. So that's that's that'll be a place to get that discussion started um, and hopefully that'll be a continuing relationship. Thank you. Uh, supplementary, Emily Cleveland. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, my second question, Madam Chair, is in regards to, um, I guess, the jurisdictions. And when I first started as an MLA, <clears throat> right out of the gates, one of the top kind of um, inquiries that I had from different constituents in Yellowknife here was in regards to child and family services. So I was quite surprised to see that uh, within the annual report, there was uh, one inquiry that related to NWT Health and Social Services Authority. And so I'm just wondering what what um, parameters that, uh, that you have to be able to work with families that might have um, complaints that have to do with child and family services, what type of an outreach um, that you have been able to do so far, and kind of um, if, they, if you have had uh, any that relate to child and family services specifically. Thank you. Ms. Langua. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. So I did get a couple of, uh, of inquiries earlier in the year, and, and they may in some cases have been attributed to Health and Social Services, the department, rather than the authority, depending on, on what the issue was. So I, I do think there was there was more than one um, that, that had to do with that. The difficulty is, um, with children um, who are in care under the Child and Family Services Act, there's really strict confidentiality provisions. I can't get get access to that information and uh, even, even to have confirmation that that child is in care. So some of the issues that were coming up earlier in the year with the foster parents, I could have looked into things that happened that were unfair to the foster parents themselves. So for example, if they were put in unsafe situations or you know, if they weren't getting getting adequate communication, I could look at that, but I couldn't look at anything to to deal with the children. And I would also say, you know, the the other thing when dealing with with 
um, children, children in care or children at risk is there are different principles that apply than administrative fairness. So, you know, the, the best interests of the child is one of those principles. And that's, that, that is something different from, from what an ombuds office does. And, and certainly neither me nor any of my staff has, has any background in that, in that kind of, um, social work or, or anything to do with, uh, with child welfare. So, so that would be a difficulty there. I did meet with the um, some representatives from the Foster Family Coalition um, early in the year, also just to let them know that the office was there and what we might or might not be uh, be able to do. Um, but I, I think that's that's why we haven't had the uptake. There's just not a lot we can do in that area. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Emily Zambler. Thank you, Madam Chair, um, and thank you for your presentation. Uh, one of the things that sparked my attention was when, you know, you said that you could go in and say if it was a, a long-term care and there was a complaint to kind of keep it. Um, so, and my question is to you is, is what about a policy that's been flagged many, many times, like you've heard in the last little while, um, and I recently had the minister come and do a tour, Minister of Health and Social Services, do a tour, and every person that, every in organization that we met with brought up medical travel and escorts, and that policy. And I brought it up in the House, and it's been raised many times by many other MLAs, and it's, it's like a historical thing, so it's not necessarily something you want to go back before you're allowed to, but it's something that's continuing mm -hmm. ongoing. Is that a policy that you could potentially take a look at and or would it be better for individuals to come forward with their complaints thank you madam chair I'm going. yeah thank you madam chair yeah it's definitely i i have had a couple of complaints about medical travel so it's it's, it's definitely something that we can look into it is helpful to hear directly from complainants and even if i were going to do that as an own motion investigation just because i need i need some specific details about what um what's happened in those cases supplementary yeah um and yeah, and I, I guess my, it's more of a comment and just to go into your traveling and I wish you would have come to the Beaufort Delta because I'm sure, you know, one of the things that I know since being in this role is people like to see you face to face. Like if I say email me, they just go to my CA, my CA has to do everything because they want to talk to somebody in person. So um, I'll, I'll look forward to you coming and I'm, I'm sure you're going to hear about medical travel in my region. <laughs> you want to comment on that, Ms. Lankwa? Um, yeah, thanks, Madam Chair. Just to say, yeah, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to, to getting up to Inuvik and, and the region as soon as I can. Thank you. Emily Bonacruz. Merci, Madam Chair, <clears throat> and merci to you too, uh, Ms. Langua, <clears throat> for being the, our first ombud person in the Northwest Territories, um, and also for <clears throat> opening the office in Hay River, which is not in Yellowknife, which is a, <coughs> it's a big win for the South, but uh, <clears throat> I also have to appreciate the efforts of uh, previous assemblies too for or setting the groundwork and making this happen, um, which is probably a long time in the making, <clears throat> especially for addressing issues for the common folk. Um, I note that uh, your report talks about fair process and, uh, and it kind of rang a bell to me um, thinking about the UNW in the Northwest Territories. Um, because I'm certain that you will get lots or do get lots of complaints from GNWT employees. Uh, I'm just wondering what's the correlation between your office and the union in addressing uh, GNWT employees' uh, complaints? Masi. Ms. Langua. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, I, I do sometimes get complaints from, from GNWT employees. 
One of the things about the Ombud Office is we are what's called an office of last resort. So we we want people to be using other ways of resolving disputes before they come to us. And if there's a possibility for the union to work with people, then that's that's usually the place that they should go first. So we don't speak directly to to the unions um, about um, about specific complaints or or issues. Um, sometimes, if the union's done all they can, then we we will go in and look at something. But often, by the time the unions dealt with it and and they've gone through various processes, there isn't isn't much more for us to look at. But we will we will always at least take a look at the process and see what happened and see if there's anything we can comment on. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Lyra. A supplementary. Yeah, yeah must must for that. Um, I'm just wondering if you could paint the picture to me of uh, the type of complaints that you were taken from, from maybe from the general population too, if you could uh, just give me an insight into something like that since uh, this is all new to many of us, let's see. Yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. So. As I mentioned in the comments, some some complaints are really just about one one transaction that went wrong. So I, for example, I've had a few complaints over the summer about um, the um, the mandatory self isolation orders and and exemptions um, that that were given under those orders. And one of the issues that came up is people were getting a response if they'd asked for an exemption that said something like your request has been considered and is denied. Period. Um, so. It might be that the, the the answer was right that they they couldn't have an exemption, but that's not a very good explanation, and it gets people really frustrated. So they want to know who made the decision and what they based it on, and what the um, uh, what the grounds for that were, and if there's uh, an appeal process and who they can talk to if they have questions. So so that's an example of of a process um, that that people might have difficulty with. Um, I've had complaints about. Um, uh, from from businesses about uh, it can be about the procurement process if they don't think it was fair uh, how it was handled uh, it can be about business loans uh, those processes I've had complaints about about housing um, I've had complaints about um, from correctional centers you know inmates get a lot of decisions from from wardens and sometimes they're not clear to them or sometimes they disagree with them and they want someone to take a second look so so we look at those as well. So it's it's really a range from from you know one transaction to you know some very complicated long-standing disputes. And I, I can't get into too much detail on those because they're they're quite specific to to specific individuals. But it really does does run the range across government. And I think in next year's report, you'll probably see a lot more authorities that have complaints and a lot more geographic distribution because I know it's quite heavy in the South Slave this year um, in the 1920 report because. People in Hay River knew knew about the um, um, knew about the office, of course, because we were there. Uh, but as word's spreading, we're getting a, a, a more uh, even distribution around the territory. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Emily Johnson. Uh, yeah. Firstly, uh, thank you for your first annual report, and uh, I'd like to thank the the previous assembly for all their work on this, and, and you know the assembly before that. It's been many years in the making, getting it on, but. Um, I, I just note that I almost, you know, more than a quarter of your complaints originated from correctional facilities. Uh, not really a surprise given the complete regulated nature of an inmate's life. Um, it's also one of the areas where I get very regular complaints, uh, both from inmates and correctional officers themselves. Uh, that it seems that there, there was a recent report that the relationship seems to be a little tense, well, perhaps also understandable given uh, the nature of corrections. I was just hoping you could expand on your uh, how those complaints and investigations have gone. My, my own experience has been that the, the confidentiality used in corrections has, has led to a, a lot of frustrations and kind of resolving issues. So if you could speak to your experience and how those complaints have been going with corrections. Thank you, Madam Chair. Ms. Langua. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. So um, we've actually got a, a fairly good relationship with corrections because we deal with them so frequently. We've been able to, to come up with some, some fast practice track procedures to deal with things. Um, so confidentiality hasn't been an issue. They've they've released all kinds of information to us as long as the um, the, the inmate has uh, or the complainant has consented to that. We, we haven't had trouble getting that. Um, 
the one of the reasons there there's such a big proportion of the complaints in 1920 it is yeah uh, corrections is always a big proportion of ombuds complaints because their day-to-day -day lives are are affected um, so much by by administrative decisions but also it, it has to do with how word got out about the office because somebody at the correctional center put up a poster I think just the day we opened and then word of mouth spread really quickly so a lot of people there knew um, very quickly about our office and word was spreading more more slowly in other places but it, it, it has been very positive um, in, a, in a couple of cases we've made some suggestions I think one of them's reported uh, in the report that's the um, the policy um, related to the suboxone treatment um, a lot of them you know it's it's the inmate disagreed with the decision and and that we reviewed the policies and looked at them and it's it's actually correct but you know they wanted somebody else to take a look at it. Um, so yeah, it's it's been positive. They've been very receptive to our suggestions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Supplementary, uh, Emily Johnson. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I'd like to move to another area. You, you recommend uh, amending the act to remove the exception that you can investigate where uh, judicial review um, exists. I, I I completely agree with that. You know. Um, judicial review exists for almost any administrative decision, so it's almost always present. Um, but I guess I, I would like you to speak to your interpretation of when a right to appeal exists, because I, I note in a number of pieces of our legislation, we, we just set out a right to appeal to the Supreme Court, and, and that's all it says sometimes. And to me, I don't think GNWD legislation is really consistent in its wording of judicial review or right to appeal, but I. Uh, perhaps I'm asking how other ombuds deal with this. I, I don't believe that something should have to go to the, the Supreme Court before you could hear it. I, I think you should probably be a step before that. So just where that ombuds role fits in in relation to judicial review and appeals to the Supreme Court. Thank you, Madam Chair. Ms. Lamgo. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. So on, on the judicial review, that, that one was jumped out at me as a red flag because when I reviewed all the other ombud legislation, it doesn't appear anywhere in there. They talk about the the um, rights to appeal, which is something different. But uh, So I started looking at judicial review more and realized that that, that could actually be a problem. Um, so with the rights to the appeal, yeah, it is, it is the case that in most ombuds or in all ombuds legislation, um, people have to wait until the time to appeal has expired and that's because we don't want people to lose their opportunity to to take an issue to the court um if uh, if they get involved in a process with us and it looks like it's going well and then maybe it falls apart and the the time to appeal has already expired then they would they would lose that opportunity so that's that's i think the purpose of that that provision being there thank you are there any other questions from members Go ahead, Emily Johnson. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I I, I understand. If, if you're reading the sorry, I'm, I'm getting into the weeds a bit here, but this is because I ultimately would like to push for the this amendment. Um, I I think this also would have to be read with your recommendation number four. Then is that if we change the the unreasonable nature of the complaint, then you you have more flexibility to hear things even when an appeal to the Supreme Court was made. Okay. I, I see that you're nodding. So, um, I'm happy with that amendment. Uh. I guess I, one last statement. I, I I would like you to maybe get back to committee with some more information on where you think you could find a role within the child and family services world. I, I recognize that you know apprehensions that are before the territorial court and it is a whole world that I, I don't expect the ombud to step into, but. Um, I think this assembly has to decide whether we are going to create, uh, you know, a child and youth advocate and create another statutory officer's position. And, and given it took, you know, a decade of advocacy to get the ombuds office up, that that, that leaves us, you know, a, probably a decade out before we have that position, unless there's some serious political will. So, I and I, I recognize the very confidential nature of that. But but is there ombuds offices anywhere else, or different variations of your office that? do somewhat get into child and family services because I think it's an area where, where there is some more needed oversight. Thank you, Madam Chair. Ms. Langua. Uh, yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. So most, um, most jurisdictions do have a, a separate child and family youth advocate. In, in Ontario, and I think also in Nova Scotia, um, they've, they've moved 
that within the Ontario Ombudsman and and I think the Nova Scotia Ombudsman as well. But it's not done under the Ombud Act. They have separate legislation to deal to deal with those inquiries because again, it's different principles that apply and different confidentiality rules and and things that apply to those cases. And they also have staff that are that are knowledgeable in that in that area of child welfare. So the Ontario um, Child and Youth Advocate that position was. Um, uh, was um, abolished just a few years ago, um, and that's when they moved uh, moved that function into the Ontario Ombudsman. But all the staff of the Child and Youth Advocate Office moved into the Ontario Ombudsman Office, so they just function basically as a separate branch with with one hand. But it, it is really a different uh, different mandate. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Are there any other questions from members? Okay. So. I'd just like to ask a couple of things. I think one of them, first of all, I want to thank you for your first year. Um, I want to thank you for visiting Fort Smith. That was a pretty crowded room that, that night you were there. And I was telling uh, the members here that uh, how you interacted with every single member in the room, and I appreciate that. And they were really interested in, in what you were doing and that you were opening the office in Hay River, and people were very pleased. And um, one of the things that I wanted to ask you about was uh, with child welfare also, uh, you say you don't look at most of those files because they are quite sensitive. And um, is it because most of the cases are related to Indigenous children? Uh, that's my first question. I Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. So, um, no, it's not because they're they're related to um, to Indigenous children. It's it's the provision in the Child and Family Services Act that have to do with confidentiality that that are extremely strict um, to protect the the privacy of children. Um, that I, I I don't think the um, the investigation powers in the Ombuds Act would would work with that. But the second part is also the question of whether we're the right people to do that, given our our skill set. It isn't really child welfare or or a social work background um, to help us apply the right principles to those those cases. And my second question is uh, uh, to be related to the corrections file. So most of your cases were corrections related. Uh, were some of them staff and or did you have a percentage of how much were staff and how much were inmates? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I know we've had complaints from corrections staff. I can't recall whether they were before or after March March 31st, but I would say the majority of the complaints came from inmates. Okay. Thank you. Uh, do you have any closing remarks, uh, Madam? Um, no, thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm um, just to to say how much I I appreciate the committee's attention to uh, to the report. Um, I know it was just tabled in October, and I, I I know you've had a really busy agenda since then. So I'm I'm very grateful that you were able to fit me in so soon, and I I look forward to a day when we can meet in person again, and um, when I can visit uh, all of your uh, your communities. Um, to uh, to meet your constituents in in person because uh, I know that's important to a lot of people. So um, once again, Madam Chair, thank you very much. Thank you, and uh, thank you for uh, members. Uh, we will we will now close the meeting. Thank you so much.